I fear that one does not catch a vampire. Welcome to my dojo. This is Kung Fu Pizza Party, and I'm your host, Brandon Knight. And today I am joined by author and podcaster Christian Ashley to review The Legend of the Seven Golden Vampires. Christian, welcome to the show. I am excited to poke your brain a little bit about that part because you are right, listeners. He's right. I told Christian about this show months ago. It may have even been the summer, like as I'm first starting to put this all together. And I was like, is that something you would be interested in? And immediately he said, yes. And I want to do this movie. And keep in mind, at that point in time, every, and I do mean every single Jackie Chan, Bruce Lee, Jet Li, Chuck Norris, Donnie Yen, Tony Jaw, Jean-Claude Van Damme, even Steven Seagal movie was on the table. All the Karate Kids, Enter the Dragon, Drunken Master. Christian wants to talk about the one Kung Fu movie starting freaking Peter Cushing. And I, I can't tell if I'm mad or insanely impressed that you came up with this option so let's you know what actually before we get to why this movie is so near and dear to you i do want to take a moment so you are the host of several podcasts here on the anazao ministries podcast network we give josh a hard time for the amount of shows he has but you you've got quite a few too tell our listeners a little bit about your show why i don't like yeah, that one is a little bit on the hiatus right now with you know classes and everything. But it, the general premise is there are certain things out there that I've watched and I really don't like. Uh, I am currently going through different genres. I'm starting with anime and I'm starting with Mushoku Tensei, which is an easy high story and has very terrible representation of women and has one of the worst main characters of all time in the story who has very little growth throughout the series. So uh, I go through it systematically, uh, not intentional pun there we'll get to that later uh just going through episode by episode things i like things i don't like things how i think it can improve itself and yeah i i really like that concept especially because here another show that you are a host of you're on systematic geekology where the general premise of that podcast is everything's great and awesome everything it's like that it's like in the lego movie everything is awesome like we systematic ecology is very pro everything you're the counterbalance of well actually (laughs) um actually not everything is perfect and great but it sounds like this movie it sounds like this movie would not be an episode of why i don't like apparently you love this movie tell us tell us why christian not for the right reasons not because it's a good movie. Uh, I like this because of the crossover we get here and this insane idea of hammer horror, which is something that I really love watching. You know, your Draculas, your Frankenstein, so on and so forth, and all the other films that they did, uh, just building off of the Universal Monsters and doing their own spin on things. And then you have Peter Cushing, who has been Van Helsing for like 20 plus times in these films, going into China to fight vampires there with a bunch of martial artists and Dracula. Like, what is there not to love about that stupid premise? This movie is indeed the, uh, this is like the ideal late night, Saturday night horror movie or like a drive-in movie kind of uh, scenario. Because you're right, this is just an insane premise. Van Helsing, Peter Cushing, who always looks old. I have yet to see him in a movie where he actually looks young. He's always ancient. Um, Going up against going up against vampires, kind of a variation of the Jiangxi. We'll get into that later on. We talked about that a couple episodes ago, but uh, Mm -hmm. I guess this segues well into our Producer Cooper's here as well, listeners. I guess this segues well into our martial art cinema history lesson for the episode. Because uh, 
as Christian alluded to earlier, this is a joint production between Hammer Films and the Shaw Brothers. Hammer was the British alternative to Universal by way of horror movies. And the Shaw Brothers, of course, were one of the two biggest movie producers in Hong Kong putting out martial art or putting out kung fu movies right alongside golden harvest which i gotta give it to hammer if you're gonna make a movie that is going to be very heavily martial art and asian good for them not to phone it in and have a lot of misrepresentation but to actually bring in people who could represent the genre well <clears throat> this is a completely and utterly bonkers movie in the idea of how the heck this works out. You have two things that you would never expect to cross over, and yet it doesn't really work together that well at times. But it's just what you're watching, just accept it. Just turn your brain off and enjoy. And I very rarely say that about films because I'm typically more more snobby and like, you know, there's got to be a purpose behind stuff that I'm watching. But for this one, uh, it, it just gets me. I like to see... Uh, Peter Cushing trying to murder vampires, and I like to see people use martial arts and beat each other up. Like uh, that's all I need. I don't need Citizen Kane in this form. I just need what is happening on this screen. And the the plot of this movie, I wish was as simple as that. It's a little weird. The movie opens with an Asian man coming to Dracula to resurrect the seven golden vampires. And Dracula says, you know what? I have a better idea. I'm going to go back as you and resurrect the seven golden vampires. And this seven golden vampires is like this ancient curse that was put on a village of these vampires who are just in a constant state of terrorizing this one particular village by the way the village killed one of the vampires originally so even though the movie is called legend of the seven golden vampires there's only six <laughs> i guess six doesn't sound as as threatening as seven um in the meantime Peter Cushing playing our hero, uh, Van Helsing, is in a region of China doing research on vampires. And wouldn't you know, he's at this university giving a lecture. And one of the people who's from that village is there to get him to come take down the seven golden vampires and ultimately find out that Dracula is still there, which leads us to a big a big showdown between Van Helsing and Dracula. Christian, are there any other uh, highlights you want to give us from this film, from your memory? Yeah, we've got our, our ragtag team of martial artists. Is it six brothers and a sister or something like that? I, it's, well, it's been a while since I've watched the movie. I did not have time to prep for this one with classes and everything. But just like their interactions with Van Helsing are... are <laughs> I don't know how to put that in the words. <laughs> Interesting. Should I put it? Interesting works. I believe it's seven brothers and a sister because that's a typical trope you see in these uh, movies. So I think it's seven brothers and a sister. I don't know why it's always that, but go on. Yeah. And uh, just their whole thing with the actually fighting uh, the six, not seven vampires in question. And unfortunately, uh, is it the sister who ends up becoming a vampire after she gets bitten? Yeah, I think in the end, it's just about everybody gets turned into a yes. vampire in the end. Um, the sister has a very dramatic scene. Yeah, it is. It, I was very like, oh my gosh, this is we're going all in here. It reminded me of yeah. the end fight scene in Army of Darkness when they're fighting all the deadites in the uh, in the medieval place. It's just like it's just carnage everywhere. Absolutely. And I mean, at the very end, like Dracula is killed again for the last time again by Peter Cushing, Van Helsing. And actually for good, because I'm pretty sure this is what kind of killed Hammer Horror to an extent, at least on the Dracula side of things. Uh, due to many factors, including a bad box office and the fact that at this point in time, Peter Cushing was reeling from the death of his wife. He was trying to like 
go on a vacation somewhere and film and try and get his mind off of things. And that caused some friction with people. And of course, you know, the Shaw brothers didn't like how the Hammer Horror people were doing things. They didn't like how they did things. It's a huge, giant mess. And somehow we got a movie from it. A movie that is, by the way, listeners, incredibly accessible. I found this movie on YouTube for free. It's there. Uh, So I will definitely throw a link in the description of this episode for you all to go check it out. Um, But yeah, it was my understanding, again, kind of going back to our cinema history lesson. My understanding is this movie is like 90% Hammer. And then the Shaw brothers did the the Shaw brothers did like the martial arts sequences essentially. But still, even at that, they, the, the British actors didn't like the Asian actors. The Asian actors didn't like the British actors. And it's just, yeah, apparently it was a hot mess behind the scenes, but you get a pretty decent movie out of it. Like you said, it's not Citizen Kane, nor did I expect that. <laughs> like, you got to know what you're getting yourself into based off of that name. But it's watchable. And when it comes to 70s horror, especially, there's plenty unwatchable movies out there. Oh, most definitely. Uh, there's not even enough time to count them all. But this one does its job effectively enough. And as we've mentioned, like, it's a huge body count by the end. That's. It uh, doesn't really come out of left field, but it's enough to be shocking in a good way. Let's talk a little bit about that uh, that body count. Let's talk about the combat in this movie a little bit. I think it's funny. You know, I'm here saying, hey, you know, you, they got the Shaw brothers. Great move. Honestly, for all the martial art people watching this movie, the hand-to-hand combat sequences, pretty basic. And my favorite part is is the fact that uh, all of the British actors and actresses, especially like the woman who is financing this expedition, they kind of have the Batman 66 role, like the the celebrity villains in Batman 66, their jobs were to react to the fighting. That's basically what they were doing. Van Helsing's son, I don't know his name, I'm going to call him Van Helsing Jr. Van Helsing Jr. gets involved in the fighting a lot. Um, and he, uh, he always gets beaten up. That's kind of the reoccurring thing. Apparently British people can't fight, um, which we kind of knew, but, um, the thing I did, yeah, you know, but the thing I did like about this Christian is that the, what they do to kind of save the combat a little bit is that the brothers and sister all have melee weapons. Someone's got a bow and arrow. There's a couple spears, a couple axes, a couple swords, I really like that, and I think that kind of saved the combat a little bit for me here. Yeah, this is not your typical martial arts fair as far as hand-to-hand for the most part. I mean, yeah, not to say that any martial arts movie is discredited the moment a weapon comes into play, as we've seen multiple times over, it can happen. But for this, it, it is enhanced by the fact they take on these different weapons to fight against these vampiric threats and their minions and everything like that. So this put me on this whole like deep dive as I'm watching this of melee weapons. I got really into melee weapons while I was watching this. And go figure, Wikipedia has an entire list, because of course they do, of all the melee weapons. <laughs> um, so Christian, I want to know, you, you're not fighting vampires. I'll, I'll set the bar there, okay? If you, if you were to train... In some sort of a melee weapon, okay? Short range weapon. What would be your go to? I can. That's an excellent question. Narrow it for me, please. Sure. So I will. uh, Some of the typical ones are like knives. It depends on like how traditional you want to be versus how versatile. So there's all the different kind of knives, short bladed objects, like a hatchet would count as well. Anything in the heavy blunt object category, brass knuckles come up there, axes with the... Um, there's even a sporting goods section in on the article. So that was like a baseball bat, pool, pool cue, paintball marker, which I don't know if that's for shooting or for hitting. 
but uh, I mean, those were yeah. those were some of the options. Okay. I, normally, I'd prefer to have as much distance between me and the target as possible, but for the sake of you know getting into the nitty gritty, just give me those brass knuckles. Let's get up close and personal. Let's make it to the point where I have to hit you in the face. You have to hit me in the face. Let's get into this brawl, and we're not going to look pretty by the end of it. Sounds like Christian is the guy to get in a bar, in a in a bar fight if on your side. Yeah, the I do like the brass knuckles idea. The knuckle dusters. Did you know that was the professional name no. for brass knuckles? It's the dumbest name I've ever heard. Um, but knuckle dusters. Um, for me, I was thinking more based off of my fighting style knife some kind of short bladed object i'm not gonna spend forever trying to decide what kind of a knife i would want to use but probably some kind of like you know maybe a switchblade switchblades are cool or a hatchet i've got some trees in my backyard now and i may have started just throwing my hatchet when i should be doing yard work um (laughs) but uh mountain man brandon taking down the trees well, you know, everybody loves Braveheart, but I love the Patriot. The very first time Mel Gibson throws that tomahawk, I'm like, yep, sign me up. I don't know what I need to learn, but sign me up for that one. I watched that movie too young. <laughs> I uh, I was actually in college by the time I had saw that one. I think I saw Braveheart right around the same time, too. I did like a bunch of those right in a row when I was in college. Yeah. Yeah. So, Christian, I told you this at the, before we recorded. Listeners, if you're dropping in for the first time here on Kung Fu Pizza Party, along with delivering high flying action in 30 minutes or less, which we are coming up on here pretty soon, we. We're also serving up wisdom one slice at a time, looking for those moments of thoughtful reflection from these films. This was the first film here on the show. I got nothing. (laughs) They did not really throw me anything to work with here, hardly at all. But there was this one line, and that was the one I opened here at the beginning of the show. It is uh, Van Helsing Jr. is talking to the woman who's financing this expedition. It's right near the beginning of the movie. And she says how big of a fan she is of his dad and how he captures vampires. And he says this line of, I'm afraid you don't capture vampires. Why not? I mean, the smart thing to do is get rid of them. So, yeah, sure, there's, there's an argument to be made of, yeah, we should scientifically study these things so that, you know, maybe we can develop a cure or maybe we can figure out other ways that are effective to kill them or keep them in place. But, I mean, at the end of the day, isn't a simpler option just to gank them? I mean, that is usually the simpler option. But it is it did kind of get me of, like, why... But like, why? I don't think I've ever seen that. Have you ever seen a movie where they just capture one? I don't know if I've ever seen a movie where they just capture a vampire. We're always just going straight to stabbing them in the heart with a stake. In one of the segments, I think it's VHS 94. There's a segment because there's different found footage films inside of the film where this kind of alt-right paramilitary organization has captured a vampire and are utilizing it for like terrorist bombings and stuff like that because like uh, vampire blood explodes in sunlight so they're using that for like their weapons and like the big gist of the film is the vampire escapes and they have to like fight it off and you know it's a lot of good times watching people die who probably should be dead I like how vampire blood explodes and doesn't make their skin sparkle in this movie. That's that seems better. Um, for some reason, I like that more. Uh, okay, I haven't seen VHS ninety four, so I'll have to go check that one out. The only one I could really think of is in Morbius. He's basically experimenting on himself. Yeah. Why is it that whenever somebody brings up Morbius, the other person laughs? Anyway. <laughs> Um, because that thing made more billion dollars at the box office and we should all be appreciative of that fact (laughs) true that is very true I don't know how I would capture a vampire 
how would you go about doing that? Because I've seen the memes that are like, you know, if you put holy water in a humidifier, you've made a gas chamber for vampires. And it's supposed to be like somebody talking to like the cashier at Wendy's or something. Um, I'm trying to think how you would even go about capturing. I mean, it kind of depends on what are the rules. I mean, what are they weak against in this film? Are they actually weak against garlic? Or like every other film in the modern era, say, oh, that's just a myth. Or are they weak against silver? Or is that just werewolves? You know, uh, are holy symbols effective? Which holy symbols are effective? Do you have to have faith in those things to actually make them effective? So assuming one of those things is working, I mean, I guess I'd use someone as bait and get them into like a silver cage or something that has an exit for the person who's being used as bait, but the vampire themselves can't get out. Or maybe it's covered in garlic or holy symbols or what have you, something that makes it where they can't get out, and that's for the best, but we can keep them in there and study. I'm trying to come up with the, the contrived way that you would keep, you know, is it just simply the fact that the vamp, you know, in some cases a vampire cannot enter a space unless they are invited. So do you make it look like a, like an, a room, like on the outside, you know, like you can go out this door, but they can't go out because you haven't invited them out. That would be so simple of a way to trap a vampire. <laughs> I like the silver cage though. That's a good idea. I mean, once again, I guess it depends on how the rules work. Like, uh, are invitations something that work in this reality? Is uh, it's a threshold, a part of the magic system of this world where you have to ask to get in? Or is it one of those things where you lose power if you don't, but you can step over it? Who knows? I, I guess if we're making this system, we have to figure that out. So, I don't know. What do you think? I would. I would. The other factor to take into consideration is the fact that we have. In this movie, we have kind of a variation of Zhang Shi. So, hopping vampires from Chinese folklore. Um, the the Zhang Shi in this movie are kind of like the movie itself: ninety percent Western, ten percent authentic. Because um, <laughs> they do hop, and then the rest is just a normal vampire. I do think they do suck chi energy, though. I don't think it's blood. Yeah. Um, I don't so know because that's what Jiangxi are better at doing because they're not yes. blood suckers. Correct. The energy vampire from what we do in the shadows is like closer related <laughs> to them than <laughs> than Western vampires. I don't know if the threshold thing. I don't know if that is part of their lore though. I've I've looked into for the episode on rigor mortis, which by the way, for those of you who like lighthearted horror, this is the one for you, not rigor mortis. Don't, don't do that one. <laughs> Super dark. Um, but when I was researching them for rigor mortis, I don't remember seeing anything about being, you know, you have to give, you have to ask permission to pass through a threshold or silver. I don't remember anything about silver either. no, yeah, I, they don't really have like typical vampire weaknesses, of course, you know, being, you know, not Western in origin. So there's going to be differences in the folklore. Uh, but Jiangxi aren't exactly my uh, forte, so I don't know. They, uh, I do remember it's Taoist symbolism is the thing that weakens okay. them, not... Uh... Not Christian symbols, which Peter Cushing does mention in this movie. I think he may say Buddhist symbols. I can't remember exactly, but they're not trying to hold up a crucifix. That I do remember. Um, and according to Rigor Mortis, and ballpark. ballpark, right? Um, and according to Rigor Mortis and the internet, sticky rice, not garlic, sticky rice is something that they don't like. Yeah. Uh, is it? Well, I think this might be across all vampire folklore, but isn't it if you like drop like a jar of pennies or, or rice on the floor, they have the instinct to actually, they have to count it. It's like a compulsion. Yes, that is a common, com that is a universal thing is that if it's like small objects that are dropped on the floor, uh, they have to stop and count every single one. So lucky for us, you know, 
Legos are abundant. Just constantly have Legos on the floor because not only will they have to stop and count them, they will step on them. And that no one's immune to that. There we go. Now we've got a perfect way to capture them. We have our little Scooby-Doo trap right above them. And we drop a jar of you know quarters or what have you, pennies, on the ground. And while they're counting them, the, the trap falls right on top of them. And we've got them. There we go. We did it. We figured it out, folks. It's foolproof. Mirrors, too, with uh, the Jiangxi. Mirrors, it's, n- it's not like in the West where they can't see the reflection. They're actually, like, terrified of their reflection, if I remember right. So you could have some mirrors involved in the trap, too, to kind of keep them, like, paralyzed and in a certain area so you can watch experiment whatever whatever evil thing we're trying to do yeah okay so christian as we all right we got it we got it we have yo maybe christian and i should do a whole episode talking about martial art horror movies maybe we should run it back sometime and do that one christian before we wrap this episode up because our our time is quickly running down here any final thoughts any final oh you know what i know what you gotta tell me here on kung fu pizza party we don't we don't do reviews like other shows yeah i don't five star ratings one to ten too arbitrary and i hate one to ten it's too many numbers that's for chumps that's for rotten tomatoes (laughs) so two questions would you watch this again and would you buy a physical media copy of this movie? Keeping in mind that there are original VHS tapes on Amazon going for about $70. I'm not kidding. Yeah. Uh, absolutely yes. And absolutely yes. This would make my complexion... Uh, uh, gosh, I was trying to think of the Little Mermaid quote. And I, collection complete. And, <laughs> yeah, I'd love it. I would definitely watch. Yeah, I would definitely watch this one again. This was a lot of fun. Uh, kind of a good, uh, just like spooky season movie. Really, for the most part, outside of the uh, unnecessary topless women, because it's a movie from the 70s. Um, it would be a pretty good movie to watch with the family, because even the violence isn't that bad, uh, like gore level wise. You just have to fast forward a few sequences for the for the young eyes. Um, but definitely would watch this again. And you know what? If I came aqu- across it in the wild for a couple bucks at like a like a resale shop, like a Goodwill or something, I'm definitely snagging it from my collection as well. All right, Christian, this has been uh, a lot of fun hanging out with you and talking about this wacky movie that we just made so much wackier trying to capture one of these things now um listeners if you want to check out why i don't like i will throw a link to the show in the description of this episode along with the link to the legend of the seven golden vampires for you all to check out but until next time thank you all for listening we'll see you back here uh next week for another episode this has been kung fu pizza party where we've been delivering high-flying action in 30 minutes or less and serving up wisdom one slice at a time.